So it's finally time to open up that cache of cash and see how it performs in games. Welcome back to Tech yes City, ladies and gentlemen. This is Brian coming back to you guys today, finally with a video on level three cache. And does it affect FPS? Not only that, does it affect frame rates and frame latency? That's the actual experience you're getting on your monitor. So for these tests, I decided to test the G3258 at 3.8 gigs. I then pitted it against the Xeon 1231 V3 and I decided to dis disable hyper threading on this CPU as well as two cores. So what we had here was pretty much an apples to apples comparison except the difference, the main difference being that this one had an extra five megabytes of level three cache to use. And I also decided to throw in the 5820K which has 15 megabytes of level three cache. But keep in mind though that this CPU is on a different platform. So I kind of, the main results that I was focusing on was these two, which was pretty much an apples to apples comparison. So anyway, without further ado, let's move on now to the benchmarks where I tested three games, Armor 3, Skyrim, and Battlefield 4. And then I'll talk about a little bit more in depth what's going on in the benchmarks, and then we'll move on to a conclusion. So let's get on to the benchmarks now, and I will put the specs of the rigs used in the description below. So if you want to check that out, then just pop down in the description and you'll be able to see that there. Though with all my benchmarks, I'll be taking you guys through piece by piece and letting you know uh, what's happening in every single benchmark and explaining things as best as I can because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are going to be like, why? What's going on here? So I'll try and explain things as best as I can. With that being said, let's move on now to the first benchmark, and that is Battlefield 4. And now this was done with pre-rendered frames set to 1, uh, also no vertical sync, ultra on the test range at 1080p. Uh, and so what we see here is that the um, really all these three CPUs impressed. The results were really good on all three of these CPUs on this test. I couldn't notice a difference. When I analyzed it with the camera footage as well, I couldn't really tell a difference. I mean, there was all, all three of these CPUs did really well on this benchmark, with the exception of the 5820K scoring a higher average FPS, though we'll talk about that later. And for what it's worth, with these benchmarks, I'm going to be focusing on the 3258 versus the Xeon, mainly, because they were done on the same motherboard, same everything, same RAM, same exact same RAM speeds, as opposed to the 5820K, which is on a different platform, the X99, and it uses DDR4 memory, though I still tried to get that as close as possible. Uh, though. And you're probably wondering as well, what is this? This is a frame latency graph. So what I've done here, instead of doing 99th percentile or anything like that, I've just taken every single frame and put it on a scatter plot. And I've put the differences between the mean. So basically any frame or any jerky experience will spike up out of proportion. And you'll probably be able to notice that when it comes to gaming. But honestly, all all these um, all these frames here came under 30 milliseconds, which is actually a pretty good score for what it's worth. So Battlefield 4, really, there wasn't much of a difference here. Uh, let's move on now to Armor 3, where we've got this, again, results that impressed on all three CPUs, with the exception of the 3258. As you can see here, it actually, uh, the graph ended early for the 3258 because that scored a lower average FPS. And we'll get onto that later with average FPSs. Uh, but for what it's worth here, all three CPUs didn't differ much from the mean. In other words, they all produced a pretty solid gaming experience. Though when I analyzed it with the camera footage, I think the 3258 exhibited a torn frame. So that was something to come out of this graph. Armor 3, um, I guess subjectively and objectively performed better on the Xeon and the 5820K than it did on the 3258. So I guess for Armor 3, level 3 cache did make a little bit of a difference there, considering it's the only factor in, uh, between the, the three CPUs uh, in, this t in these tests. So anyway, let's move on now to Skyrim, where we've got the 3258 and the um, other the 1231V3 and the 5820K really uh, putting out, again, a pretty impressive um, display here. I mean, we've got here the, the 1231v3 scoring the worst here with a frame that differed from the mean by 24 milliseconds, which again, if you're playing Skyrim on any of these three CPUs with a 660 Ti, you're going to get a pretty damn good experience. We saw here the first part of this, the um, benchmark was just absolute butter smoothness. Like, that's almost like V-Sync, even better. <laughs> like, that was incredible. Uh, so when I objectively measured this with the camera, it showed the same, uh, same thing. So if you sat me down in a blind ABC test, 
I couldn't tell you the difference at all between these three CPUs on Skyrim. Though another interesting test that I decided to throw into the mix was what if we turned on adaptive V-Sync? Would there be a difference as well? Because I'm sure there's some people who play RPGs with V-Sync on. And so uh, again, we saw here that there really wasn't much of a difference again. Even so, it probably produced a better result than it did on the previous benchmark. So that was actually a really good um, eye-opener there. So essentially, you know, and two of these games are very CPU-intensive. Skyrim and uh, Armor 3. They're CPU-intensive for what it's worth, and we weren't seeing that much of a difference. I mean, Armor 3 did show a pretty, I'd say like 7% in average frames. We'll get onto that later. Though let's look at the average FPS on Battlefield 4. So what we had here was 89.2 versus 89.35. So again, the Xeon versus the Pentium in Battlefield 4 didn't make much of a difference. Even the Pentium 3258 edged out on minimum FPS. So that's probably just variance. Though what we saw here was the 5820K pulling ahead in the higher average FPS. And this was consistent. When I did the benchmarks, because I pretty much, you know, I double check all my benchmarks, we saw that the 5820K score at a higher average, I mean, higher maximum, which helped it pull a higher average, in my opinion. So that was pretty interesting. So maybe in Battlefield 4, a lot of level 3 cache does help give you a better gaming experience. So that's something to keep in mind. Maybe, I mean, when I, again, when I looked at the camera footage, I couldn't. <laughs> really tell a difference at all in this game. Uh, looking at Armour 3, this was the biggest result. So this probably single-handedly, this is the most important graph to look at in all these benchmarks is Armour 3 because uh, what we saw here was the 1231 V3 scoring probably, yeah, like I guess off the top of my head, 7% difference in frames over the 3258, the 1231 V3. So for what it's worth, Armour 3 made a difference. And the funny thing about this is, and this is where it sort of opens up another question for me, is, is there a sweet spot for level 3 cache on games? Because I know when I tested the 4670K that I had at 4.6 gigs, uh, as opposed to 5820K at 4.2 gigs, the difference was pretty much like correlated in clock speeds. So maybe there's a difference, uh, maybe there's like a, a sweet spot for level 3 cache. That's interesting. And in, in that being said, it most likely depends on the game as well. So if you're playing Armor 3, like if you're just an Armor 3 diehard fan, you'll probably want to get something like a 4790K. That'd probably be the best CPU bang for buck for this game, or a 4690K, uh, that being said. But I mean, honestly though, the 3258, just clock it higher, and you'll get an absolutely fine experience as well. So anyway, let's move on now to the next graph here. This is uh, FPS on Skyrim. Really, this was the most, you know, one of the most insignificant results here. Like, it just, yeah. I mean, I didn't even put the adaptive V-Sync results in because they were pretty much identical. Uh, and so we got here two, I mean, these are almost identical as well. You got two extra FPS coming out of level three cache. So uh, only one game really made a difference in FPS and the frame latency and when I measured it with the camera didn't make too much of a difference. Though another interesting benchmark that I will throw into the mix is Cinebench. When I ran Cinebench, the actual Cinebench test itself didn't show a difference, but the OpenGL test showed a huge difference. This was with the only, the like, again, I had two cores, two threads. The, the only difference was the level three cache, and it made a huge difference on that OpenGL test. So that was something interesting that came out of the benchmarks on Cinebench. Anyway, guys, with that being said, let's move on now to a conclusion for you guys, and we'll talk about pretty much what just happened. So in conclusion, the results were pretty anticlimactic. I came into these benchmarks expecting more of a difference from level three cache, but the reality is there just wasn't that much of a difference between these three CPUs, coupled with a 660 Ti. Now the biggest difference to be gained was from Armor 3, where it showed like an 8% increase in frames, which was pretty big. And that probably raises another question of, is there a sweet spot for level three cache with certain games? And the main answer is, it depends on the game. That's the biggest thing that I got out of this. Every game's coded differently and level three cache can make a difference, though it really pales in comparison to other things like your core speed, your core clock speed, the IPC, your core and thread count, and the price of the CPU. So level three cache ultimately isn't something that you should really take into heart when buying a CPU. 
Though it is pretty important for other things, just for gaming, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Now, another thing is too, is I coupled this CPU with a 660 Ti, and this is something that I'm gonna stress from this video, even though it's not really related, is that when you're buying a low-end CPU like the G3258, make sure you couple it with like a low-end or a mid-range graphics card. Do not go coupling this thing with a, like an R9 290X or a GDX 980. Like I've got a heap of comments now where people are telling me they're getting a crap gaming experience and they've got a 3258 and they're coupling it with a high-end CPU. Like, don't do that. I've tested it in the past. I've tested my Pentium with the 780 Lightning in the past, and it was just a crap experience. Like, I seriously had more fun playing games with a G3258 on a 760 than I did on a 780 Lightning. So that's something to keep in mind. When you're going with a low-end CPU, just remember that you have to balance things out. Now, DX12 might change that. I don't know. There's not many mainstream games, or if any, that use DX12 at the moment. So for what it's worth, level 3 cache doesn't make too much of a difference for games. And if you have any comments or questions, drop a comment in the comment section below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And if you haven't already, then hit that like button as this video took me a long time to do in terms of compiling and double checking the results. And I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. And you can hit the subscribe button if you want to or check me out on social media. And I'll catch you in another tech video. Peace out for now. Bye. Well, conditions rubbing your feet on carpet, whatever, um, producing a, you know, just a little bit of static electricity, is that enough to damage computer components?